actually works in in practice. So yeah, and that's the real problem is misinformation. Yeah, and that's what I think. Like like I said, more and more I'm interacting because in the a lot of the judges that I interact with they're conservative, and I, I realize a lot of them kind of are in line with a lot of progressive things thinking. Yeah, but you know, but they stick to those principles, like you said, that traditional principles, like, yeah, I just can't be a Democrat, though. It's, yeah, it's tribalism. They just, yeah, they're, tribalism. Just, like, they're more comfortable with the people react. they grew up with. Exactly. So a lot of it is like, okay, whatever. Plus, liberals have had a problem of marketing, of course, and they always market them, or they, in the early 2000s, it was big government versus little governments, and the liberals were, like, comfortable identifying with big government for some reason when it's not an accurate way of describing the political situation and like of course why would you want to be why would you want to support big governments you know big government's scary we've seen that, that happen so it's just marketing it's like it's marketing. we see we see in reality who is the big government party and who's the who's the party of liberty yeah and it's like i just i caution people that you think, oh, because these people are Republicans and that they really believe. I had one lady, I worked a case where a guy hired me. He's helping homeless homeless people and, and stuff like that. And this lady wants them out of their area because it's like a residential nice area. Like, they make, you know, six-figure area. And it's like, oh, we want them out. And it's like, well, you can't. It's his house. He does what he wants to do in his house. You know, you can't tell him what to do. Yeah. But he's like, well, it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing to the neighborhood. You know, those Karens. Yeah. Um, the NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Yeah. And then so when you look at that, this Karen is using the government to put levies and code enforcement and calling code enforcement. And and I'm sitting there helping this guy out. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, this is big government trying to tell this guy how to live his life. Yeah. You know? They care more about protecting their property and using the government to uh, uphold state capitalist property rights where they like, I don't know, zoning, stuff like that, where they exactly. care so much more about the property value than building, you know, a housing program in the neighborhood to help with the homelessness the issue. But they're like, oh, yeah. can't let my property value drop. Yeah. And these people, are, they are Republicans. But when there's a lot of Democrats like that in in California, it's mostly so, just rich people. It's rich people. Yeah. So when you look at it, you're like, well, some Republicans are just contradictory because, yeah, you hate big government, but you're using big government to tell someone how, how and what to do in their house. And it's like, but so I just when Republicans say, oh, we're not about government. And you look like and you look at how to utilize government so much. And you're like, it's not true. But here's the thing. What is government? Is government when we socially spend money to, you know, do cash transfers and, you know, provide public health care? Or is government the state, the authority figure, which is if you think about the actual representation of the state, it is mm -hmm. the exact things that Republicans want to preserve. The yeah. police, the military. Yeah. Stuff like that, where they've literally used the state threat of violence to uh, push people to submit to their concept of law. When liberals are like, you know, they they want a form of government, but it's not big authoritarian government the way Republicans do. Republicans don't want to spend money, and they want to use the gov or they just want to use the the cops to to force homeless people off of public streets and want them to, you know. Up, adhere drug laws and arrest people if they are if they find them suspicious and the Patriot Act and it's yeah. there's nothing really consistent about small government Republicans in in reality or at least yeah maybe I'm sure some of them truly believe in it but mm -hmm. like the Republican presidencies and legislatures have never followed through they always spend they spend more than Democrats and they they maybe don't spend more but they increase the deficit because they're not taxing and like yeah. like i discussed last episode it's the re the reason we have deficits is not a spending problem it's a lack of taxation problem you know yeah. what i mean because yeah. the money's still in circulation and if you 
spend all this money and give it to the military and you spend all this money and give it to corporate subsidies and stuff like that, but you don't tax it because you're also giving the same people that you're giving subsidies to, you're lowering their taxes, you're going to have an inflation <laughs> inflation, and you're going to have uh, a deficit problem because the money the money is in the wrong hands, essentially, and there's way too much of it in a circulation. Exactly. So the, the real question is, how do we solve this issue? Okay. And we have we have some really good models, you know, around the world of countries that do a lot of programs efficiently. And it and it does require a lot higher rates of taxation. But it's like you can't it's not just taxation is good because taxation that goes to bad things is bad. It that it's pretty pretty blanket. But if yeah. you use money to invest in workers, invest in ways to grow the economy then it doesn't matter that you're spending money because you're growing the pool of money. You're growing your GDP, you're growing GDP, you're growing the working class in their purchasing power. It's it, it all depends on how you spend the money and who has wealth and in, in power in society. Yeah. And like I just, and like I said, in the last episode, we, we would be a lot better if we had a lot more people who can invest their money in in the companies that they want to be successful. The thing about a market is the market is supposed to dictate value in society and which companies are good and which companies are bad. And if you have the richest thousand people making all the investments, then all you're going to see is companies that are super profitable, not companies that are valuable or contribute to society necessarily. So we just end up with a bunch of companies that turn over profits, not companies that innovate and add things to your lives. So we want the people to be using the market, consumers deciding what is what's valuable and what companies should succeed and what con- companies should fail. Exactly. So how do we how would how do we reduce wealth inequality? Well, for us, I mean, how do we reduce wealth inequality? Is by adopting systems that addresses those. Um, disparity in, in wage gaps. Yeah, um, I think we talked about yesterday um, discussing the Nordic system and how they've had programs establishing to address those wage gaps mm-hmm. by investing in their by taking investments into their their businesses, you know, and 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 then having those businesses provide a dividend to its people um, provides is more mon- for me a more monetary asset to kind of decrease the wage gap between the haves and have nots. And so for us, I think that's what we need to look at. I mean, how do we address the disparities? And we have all the top 100 countries in the world are in America. But yeah. then we have one of the lowest poverty rates. Well, let's see what the American poverty rate. The American poverty rate is, is roughly like 17%. It's in that the range plus or minus 2% maybe, but it's it's not. I don't know where it ranks compared to the others, but I know where which countries rank above them, and it's it's countries that. I mean, that actually care about reducing poverty. The United States has an issue where they're not trying to fix the issue of poverty and wealth inequality. They're just mm-hmm. trying to you know subsidize like the very end of the the very end of the issue. If you're like. Let me think of how to phrase this. Like the way they're means testing programs. Yeah. They're not, they're not doing it. All right. Let me, let me, let me start over. Mm -hmm. The United States wastes so much money on administrative costs because we, we means test all of our welfare programs. And that's also part of the reason why conservatives have such a strong rhetoric against us giving out welfare. Because it's yeah. like, oh, you want to give money specifically to people who who aren't going to work hard and they're not contributing to society when the Nordic countries don't have the same kind of anti-welfare propaganda because it's they have universal programs. They have programs that apply to every single citizen. So if if you're if you're a conservative, then you can't just say all oh, my money is going straight to poor people because you're getting the benefits as well, even if you don't need the benefits. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So it's a lot easier to feel like you're in it together and you're not creating such a class divide. The, the concept of Marxism is fundamentally that we have a class issue where there's the proletariat, which was the working class, essentially the employed people in society have completely different material interests and political interests than the people who own the means of production, the really wealthy people who own shares. Yeah. So fundamentally, the rich people are always going to push policies that are against the benefit of the rest of us because they don't have the same interests. Their interests are specifically in not paying taxes, consolidating wealth, using that wealth to invest in and have an ease of business. When for a more majority of Americans, that stuff doesn't matter to them because they're just trying to pay their bills. They're just trying to get a better job so they can reduce the debt in their personal lives and try to advance their own education, which is which is cost barrier. Yeah. So there's there's so many issues where we could we would be a lot better off if we had the same issues in society and we would have a lot more consensus consensus if the, mm-hmm. the people in society had the same issues we we don't we're not trying to fight against each other and we don't have such a disparity of power where the wealthy people actually can control legislation because of how much wealth and power they have and in the in the state which gives the uh gives the power to the employers they don't there's no inherent reason why if there's an employer and 10,000 employees why the government should protect the right of the employer When there's, that's not an inherent concept. That's something that the government in our country decides that the this their property rights, their definition of what's more valuable. I think our country was founded on these principles of. um, Well, I take that back. It wasn't really founded on that. I think it became the business community hijacked it really the country after the great depression it was this you know the great depression happened and all these major corporations popped up when the the food industry popped up the technology industry boom the the, well there's there's some there's also a giant problem with business interests in the early 1910s and 1920s Mm -hmm. like obviously that's when the giant monopolies controlled everything the rockefellers where they would have conglomerates of com- of companies that owned other companies that that owned other companies that all st- stem yep. from the same shareholders, you know. And Teddy Roosevelt initially did something about that, and he yeah. you know did trust busting and antitrust laws, and then and then we had a, another period of Republicans who took over Calvin Coolidge, Warren Harding, mm-hmm. uh, Herbert Hoover. Just those are three Republican presidents who only deregulated. Uh, policies and they just gave so much money and power to the wealthiest people that it led to stuff like the Dust Bowl where there wasn't farm regulations and mm-hmm. we had we had uh, the, the farmers would would uh, plant they wouldn't take a break in between uh, like their their crop so essentially yeah. they would overuse the soil and that the that and they didn't like i think i don't know exactly about farming but i know that you're supposed to like take a time off so that the soil can like rejuvenate itself or whatever but since they were trying so yeah, hard like it, oh, okay so then they didn't allow the land to breathe a little bit right? exactly so it was just kind of like constantly doing like they're constantly it. trying to, to use the same soil to to get all their yield and then we had like years and years of completely fruitless land of that's why they called it the dust bowl we had such a crop or a, an issue of lack of agriculture yeah. and we had such a food shortage and there's yeah. ob- obviously the banking problems all mm-hmm. the sort of stuff that fdr had to fix once our entire society collapsed mm-hmm. so that we so we had a we had a couple decades of of solving that problem and then we just went we went right back to to a neoliberal policies i mean the fifties Republicans were were definitely corporatist, but at least the, they still the employees still had a better share, a better share of the the product that they produced. Mm-hmm. And we had a, we actually had a strong middle class. Did like so one of the biggest companies at that time was like Henry Ford. 
I don't know if Henry Ford did they allow did they give their workers like shares of the company? I'm I don't think sure. they gave them shares, but okay. there was a thing where um Henry Ford is famous for he initially he he would pay his employees more than the market share because he realized oh, that if his employees weren't making enough money to buy his cars that he was actually losing money and he yeah. would do he would actually make a lot more profit in turn if his employees would use the money that he paid them to invest in their own cars so that mm-hmm. he would just get that money back so there was there was there was i don't know there's reasons why capitalists had an incentive at that time to do stuff like that but we've just so moved did, farther and farther into my question is when did capitalism lose its way when did it become it's when did it become the point of mass profits no no benefits to the workers um disparity in upper management and lower management wages great disparity there's always been disparity but great disparity i think well if you look at the numbers the graphs yeah. it's pretty clearly it was in the 1970s okay in the 70s that's yeah. when we, the tide turn which we had we had we had kennedy we had lbj in the 60s and they did a lot for the working class mm-hmm. and nixon did a lot of bad crap and so did <laughs> gerald ford yeah. jimmy carter wasn't great either that's the problem we didn't have mm-hmm. and then we went straight from the 70s where the, the line, the capitalism is starting to be a downturn mm-hmm. to Ronald Reagan seeing, oh, we got to, we, ta- capitalism is not working exactly how we want it to. We need trickle down economics. That's when wealth inequality went to, to astronomical levels. Yeah. Because he was just direct, I think our top marginal tax rates were at like 70%, maybe 90% in the 50s, the very top tax rate. Which is, if you know, it's their tax brackets. It's not like rich people are getting taxed ninety percent of their wealth, no. but the top amount of money that they're earning was at ninety percent. Those numbers went down to like 30 percent or something. It astronomically different yeah. in, under the Ronald Reagan administration. So it's rich people kept got to keep more and more of their money, and it was supposed to trickle down, and they were supposed to invest that money, and it resulted in GDP gro- growth because there was a lot more private investment in the United States. Yeah. You know, a lot more company or a lot more people around the world, wealthy people, saw the United States as a good w- way to make money. So we have GDP growth. So we have a lot more money circulating. That's why we have such a high GDP. But at the same yeah. time, it's not the it's not the poor people that get to see the 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 returns on that. We just yeah, have a high. Yeah. We just had a high. Really, a lot of people were uh, distracted by our high per capita. Yeah. You know, per capita, we are we're one of the richest countries in the world. But if you have yeah. 10 people in a room and nine of them make $20,000 a year and one of them's a millionaire, yeah, you have a really high per capita if you do the average and you average that out. But that's not, yeah. you're not, you're not a really wealthy room. You just have one wealthy person in the room. Yeah. So the United I mean, States has been on a downward trajectory for a while. The 70s, right? Pretty much. Bill Clinton had the same problems because he, Cared a lot more about about electability and about catering to the uh, the middle of the road voters that yeah. he did. Um, you broke up. You froze on me, Seth. 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 Well, guys, we lost Seth uh, for a little bit. I'm pretty sure he's going to jump back on. Um. So kind of where itself was left off in the 1980s and when Reagan um, and kind of issuing these new policies and President Bill Clinton kind of adopting his policies lightly, um, ushering a new kind of agenda um, for the Democratic Party. I think that the political cycle, you know, kind of enabled the capitalism growth, but also was not enough mechanisms to bring in the lower class and the middle class up to the upper class. And so I think that kind of brings us where we're saying today, which is how do we find our approach to get us back with a capitalist mindset and a capitalist thinking? And then once we do that, have that capitalist mind, capitalist thinking, but how do we make it so that the lower class and the middle class has an opportunity to come up? 
And Seth wanted to talk about the Nordic approach and how they use this approach of invest the public investing in companies and then the, the public getting dividends, um, which we thought was a great approach. Um, we've always talked about UBI being an uh, approach that we um, we like to address those disparities. Um, I also want to talk about other ones that I think that are pretty interesting. For example, we have I was a big time advocate of you know having free college tuitions and student reimbursements because I think that those are the things that remove the crippling debt on our 18 to 35 or 40 year old population and creates a new middle class. Cause right now we have no middle class. And so by removing student loan education plans, um, I believe that that would inject more stimulus to the middle class and bring more people into it. And most people can afford houses right now so that they can you know, start their families, afford a house, get a car. So that's what some of the approaches that we had. Going to keep. Um, so that's what we wanted to talk about. Um, for now, we're going to cut it a little short today. As uh, obviously Seth's having some technical issues, I'm going to reach out to him. Let's see if we can go ahead and, um, and restart this. All right, thanks. <laughs>